morning, church. Happy Palm Sunday. It's good to be here with you. Easter season is the anniversary of Christ's death and resurrection, uh, but it's more than an anniversary. It's an answer. It's an answer to humanity's fallenness. It's God's response to our greatest need. Uh, Madeline Langle said that Easter is always the answer to, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I know for me, growing up in the church, Palm Sunday was a fun day. It was a memorable day. It was this celebration, a chance for, for me and all the other kids in the church to uh, pray up through the crowd, carrying our palm branches and singing Hosanna to the King of Kings. I remember talking about what Hosanna meant. Save us. Rescue us. I remember that we usually talked about what we cry out to Jesus today. And maybe what we cry out to Jesus isn't so different on days like this and times like this from what the Jewish people cried out to him on that day. That's the first question that I want us to consider this morning before we even look at the people on what the people on that day were shouting. What are we crying out to Jesus for today? What do we think that he's come to do? Let's consider that question and then we'll return to it later. Would you go to the Lord with me in prayer as we enter into his word? Father God, we thank you this morning um, that you are not like us. Um, So often when we see needs, when we see uh, difficult and broken situations, we are quick to run in the opposite direction. But Lord, looking at the needs of your people, you went, your holiness led you directly to us. And we're so thankful, Lord, that, that that's the kind of God that you are. We ask, Lord, this morning that you would uh, um, be near to those who are in need of comfort. Um, I, I just uh, One word that's been on my mind as I've considered Palm Sunday is, is desperation. People on that day were desperate. They wanted an answer. And uh, Lord, I, I think uh, we get desperate when we, uh, when we suffer loss or when we get a difficult diagnosis or when we hear that there's a fire in the next canyon over, we get desperate. But we ask, Lord, that you would help us to live a, a life that is desperate for you, a life that is constantly turning to you like... Uh, like walking into a dark room, we search for the light switch, Lord, in every situation of our lives, in every new day would we be going to you in desperation, knowing that, Lord, you are a God of mercy. You are a God who sees us. Lord, would you just, can, just speak to us today through your word as we reflect on the, the, the messages of Palm Sunday. We love you, we thank you. Amen. It looked like a party like a coronation. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. If the people were sure of anything on that day, they were sure of who Jesus was. They were sure of what he had come to do. It's why they sing out, Hosanna, oh save us. But behind the scenes, behind this veil of praise, something was brewing. Something was off. There was this dissonant chord, a disconnect. But the people didn't hear it. They they couldn't sense it. But there were some striking things taking place in and around Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So look for those things as we read this passage together. Luke 19, 28 through 44. The words will be on your screen, but I definitely encourage you to follow along in a, with, a, with a Bible in, uh, in front of you. After Jesus had said this, the parable of the talents, Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as it was told to them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? 
They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the mountain of, down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, Jesus Christ wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now is hidden from your eyes, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you on the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. The first thing we need to see is the animal that Jesus has specifically requested to ride into Jerusalem on. And how it contrasts so sharply with the expectations of the Jewish people. Not everyone is thrilled that Jesus enters onto the scene on the back of a donkey. And not just a donkey, on a colt, the text reads, the foal of a donkey. The foal of a donkey does not scream king of power and might. It is humble. It is ordinary. It's not a stark white horse. It's not a war horse or a Clydesdale. Clydesdales weren't even a, a breed of horse until 1826. And yes, I, I had to look that up because I'm not an equestrian. Um, but, I, I, <laughs> but nevertheless, Jesus did not ride in on this magnificent animal, but a young donkey. This was, of course, to fulfill the prophecy given in the book of Zechariah, Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you righteous and victorious lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So see him on a foal. This is how Christ approached his people. This is how he chose to come to us. This is a major statement about God's plan and the nature of how he would rule as king. This is a message that at the time was either misunderstood or ignored. But I can't help but think of, of how we consider this today. How do you feel about the Son of God on the foal of a donkey? How does that strike you? Can you imagine a world leader doing something like this? Can you imagine a president doing this? Other than Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt would have absolutely done this. Uh, he would have probably ridden anything on a parade, a moose, an elephant, a water buffalo, a pig, but no other leader. I just know there's some history buffs in the, in the audience who are like, there is one. You're right, there is one. But no one else, no one else would choose an animal this humble. Jesus has his disciples acquire this unridden foal, um, which was not actually as unusual as you might think. Um, it was actually a, com a fairly common practice at the time that people could be asked to surrender an animal for a dignitary uh, to use. Everything happens just as Jesus said that it would. The disciples throw their cloaks on the foal and Jesus points toward Jerusalem. His choice of foal becomes uh, more clear to us. Uh, he would not be the Messiah of, law, of raw and brute force and power, but of humility and service and love. It's our first clue that he's not the kind of Messiah that the world thought they were getting. This was what God chose. And I wonder today, do we, does the Christian church choose to follow in the same way? Is this at all the sort of means that we think will affect the world? Do we follow in the same vein of Christ, surrendering power, choosing meekness? Meekness, remember, one of the first words he spoke of is being blessed in the, the, the Beatitudes and offering vulnerability. As Jesus approaches the city, people began to lay their cloaks on the road before him. This was very much like the, the sort of red carpet treatment of the ancient world. Matthew 21 is the parallel passage to Luke's account. 
Uh, and it contributes that in addition to the cloaks, the people were cutting palm branches from the trees and spreading them out on the road as well. And I can't remember if I touched on it last year, so I want to mention it again this year. Palm branches were significant. Um, it, was, it was an absolute affront to the Romans who were around them. Palm branches were one of the symbols of the Jewish people. To lay down your palm branch before Jesus meant that you were showing your allegiance to him and not Rome. Luke doesn't mention the palm branches in his account at all, which might seem strange, but he doesn't write about them because Luke's message, his gospel, was not written primarily to a Jewish audience, but to a Gentile one. Matthew wrote to a, to a Jewish audience, and they would have been very familiar with the symbolism of the palm branch. The Jewish people waved palm branches at the Feast of Tabernacles, which looked forward to the end times, eschatology. But this was Passover. Uh, but, but this highlights sacrifice and forgiveness of sins, is what Passover does. Jesus was going to bring both of these issues forward, Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, the forgiveness of sin and eschatology, this final deliverance. Furthermore, in Jesus' day, these actions of laying down cloaks and palm branches were, was full of symbolism, full of meaning. Dropping your garments and laying down leaves was a sign that said, you are the man. You are the man. We are going to trust in you. In the Old Testament, when, when Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, was coronated king in 2 in Kings 9, the people acknowledged their acceptance of him as king by taking off their outer garments and throwing them on the road as he came by. It was them showing that they were accepting him as king and that they would respect him and that they would follow him. So as the people celebrated Christ's entrance into Jerusalem, it was all so clear. You are our king. We will follow you. And the louder it got, the more sure they became. Jesus really was the Messiah they were waiting for. Ignore the donkey. In 1838, at the coronation of Queen Victoria, she was given a crown with rubies and sapphires all around and a 300-carat diamond in the middle of her crown. She was given a scepter with a 516-carat diamond on the top. It was an incredible display, unbelievable, magnificent. The people of Jerusalem are attempting to do the same thing with the resources that they have. They are coronating the one that they believe to be their powerful Messiah. There is nothing casual about Palm Sunday. They are motivated. They are passionate about seeing Jesus as their Messiah. Matthew records in his account, uh, Matthew 8, 21, 11, 10, and 11, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. I shared last year on Palm Sunday that the word stirred here is a very tame translation. Uh, the Greek word is seismos. It's where we get our word seismic from. It's, it's saying, it's communicating that he came in with the impact of an earthquake. He shook the city. It was impossible not to feel it. Uh, that's the sort of impact Jesus' coming had on the Jewish community. But let's pause for a moment, because even as all of this is going on, Luke's account stays focused on the person of Christ. There's a million places the camera could pan to in this scenario, but Luke stays right on Jesus. As Luke passes the Mount of Olives, his disciples start to praise God. Verse 27 of Luke's account. And they echo the words of Psalm 119. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The praise begins with Christ's disciples, his closest followers, we're told. And then it spreads throughout the whole crowd. This might help us to understand how the crowds so easily fluctuate from praising Jesus one day and crucifying him days later. For his disciples Everything seems to be happening just as they longed for. For everyone else, 
this is just a time to be excited. They are all praising the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But not everyone was excited. The Pharisees come and ask Jesus to rebuke his disciples in the crowd, and Christ responds that even if his disciples don't cry out, creation will. The rocks will cry out. We see throughout Scripture that that when there is an injustice, God's creation can can at times avenge the wrong. We see this in Genesis 4.10 and Habakkuk 2.11 and James 5.4. Understand that Jesus is saying this to the Pharisees. Inanimate objects, these rocks, know more about what's going on than you do. They know what I've come to do. And then in in these final four verses of this account, Jesus reveals his heart to us and shows us the the tragedy of the situation that's going to play out Easter week. Jesus' heart breaks over his people because coming into Jerusalem, the heart of the Jewish people is the Messiah, is the Savior, and they will not recognize him. They wanted the white horse and the the warrior king. They wanted political freedom, someone to free them from Rome. And they got an ordinary looking man who had no beauty or majesty, nothing that would attract us to him, Isaiah 53 tells us. He rides in on a foal. You or I would look ridiculous. I just want to emphasize how ridiculous we would look on a foal. Picture me, Nate Roshan, on the foal of a donkey. They didn't know he would forgive them of their sins. They didn't know. They wanted other things. Jesus shares, Luke 19, 41 through 44. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. That has always been one of the most striking passages He's doing what he came to do and he sees the city and, and, and I just, I love that he's a man who's willing to weep and mourn over what is wrong. This is our God. He is moved. He weeps over the city, his city, his people. And he says, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another, and they wouldn't. The Romans would take the stones from the temple in Israel, in Jerusalem, and they would use them to build a a pier out into the Mediterranean. Not one stone would remain on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. As Jesus approaches the city with palm branches and cloaks being laid down ahead of him, he weeps. As he experiences fanfare, he mourns over the city. And the line he speaks is fascinating. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. We see the immense gulf that is open between what the people seem to want and what Jesus came to offer. For all the things we could say that the people wanted in a Messiah, someone to free them from their Roman oppressors, give them political power and prominence, to raise them up as a people, for their enemies to be brought low and justice to be served. What they wanted, I would say most generally, is for God to fix things. That's what they wanted. At the end of the day, he didn't fix those things that were broken, what the people on that day knew to be broken. Only a short time later, in 70 AD, the temple would be destroyed. Not one stone would remain on another. Jews and Christians alike would be persecuted, hung on crosses, and burned. If anything, human suffering increased after Christ's death. After his life and death and resurrection. He did not fix what was physical and tangible. If they only knew what would bring them peace. But it's one thing to focus on what ancient peoples wanted from their coming Messiah. 
I want to spend the rest of our time together returning to that question, asking you what you want from Christ. What are you looking to him for? And maybe more important, what do you think he came to do? Not just then, but right now. Because the brokenness that existed at the time of Christ, I don't know, <laughs> I don't even know what you, uh, I don't know if living in a cave is even enough. I think in a cave you would know things aren't right in our world. There is still injustice. There is still corruption. There is still abuse. We live in the already but not yet where we are told of what is to come But not everything is healed and made right the side of heaven. Not everything is as it should be. Isaiah 2 describes a people streaming to the mountain of God. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations. He will judge between the nations, and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The great hope is that we know that that's coming, but it's not here yet. There is is a dividing line that stands today in the Christian church concerning what Jesus really came to do. Did he come to fix things? Did he come to make this world right, right now? Did he come to right all of the injustices? Did he come to give us political clout? I've got to tell you, he didn't just come to bandage our wounds. He didn't just come to help us find our lost car keys. He didn't just come to help us feel better or sleep more soundly. He came to free his people from their sins. Church, he came to redeem. And it came with a cost. Thomas Akempis wrote that Jesus today has many who love his heavenly kingdom, but few who carry his cross. Many who yearn for comfort, few who long for distress. Plenty of people he finds to share his banquet, few to share his fast. Everyone desires to take part in his rejoicing, but few are willing to suffer anything for his sake. There are many that follow Jesus as far as the breaking of bread, but few as far as drinking the cup of suffering. Many that revere his miracles, few that follow him in the indignity of the cross. I say to you again, what were we expecting? What did he come for? There will be a day when God will fix all things. I'm confident in that. He's in the business of wiping every tear from our eyes. He's in the business of being the light so that one day we will not need any other light. There will be a tree there, we're told, Revelation 22, for the healing of nations. We're going to need that. We will need all of those things because this side of heaven, we still live in a broken place. Before I get sorry for myself and the situation we all live in, the difficulty of navigating difficult family situations, incredible uh, socioeconomic and political things going on around our entire world, before we get down on the hand we've been dealt, John Stott reminds me, Before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. Jesus Christ went to the cross for me, for me, for me, because of me. He went to free me from myself. He went to free me from myself to right the wrong that I committed. And so I owe him my all. 
And so I bend my knee, and so I cannot withhold forgiveness from another. And so I must, I must surrender all and pick up my own cross and love because he first loved me. Let me close with this benediction from uh, from Isaiah 53 that I hope will help continue to prepare our hearts for Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Would you pray with me? Who has believed our message? Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace. If we only knew what would bring us peace. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid, instead of on us, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before its shears is silent. He did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had none done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Before I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen and thank God.